Amen. Amen. I welcome every one of us to a Saturday workers' training tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. And I pray that the word of God will penetrate every heart and do good in every heart in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, we thank you for the workers' meeting tonight. We're asking, Lord, you speak to every heart. Amen. Wake us up. And everything we ought to do, grant us the grace and the strength and the power to do everything in Jesus' name. Amen. Your power cannot fail in our lives. Amen. And we will not fail in the duty and responsibility you have called us to in Jesus' name. Amen. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. We're coming to Matthew chapter 4. And I'm reading verses 19 and 20. Matthew chapter 4, verses 19 and 20. And he says unto them, follow me. And I will make you fishers of men. Verse 20. And they straightway left their nets and followed him. Please underline the word, left. They left their nets and they followed him. Verse 22. And they immediately left the sheep and their father and followed him. Please underline the word, left. In Mark chapter 10, reading from verse 28, Mark 10, verse 28, it says in verse 28, then Peter began to say unto him, lo, we have left all and we have followed thee. Please underline the word left. Luke chapter 5 and I'm reading from verse 11. Luke 5 11. And when they had brought the ships to land, they forsook all and followed him. The word forsook. They left, they forsook the same thing. In John chapter 4, reading from verse 29, John chapter 4, let's back up to verse 28. In verse 28, the woman then left her water pot and went her way into the city. And says unto the men, Come see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? You will see in all those passages that we came across the word left. They left something. They left the past. They left what they were used to. They left their profession. They left the occupation in their hand and they followed Christ. Tonight in particular, we're looking at the word of God concerning the believer's absolute surrender to Christ's lordship. The believer's absolute surrender to Christ's lordship. You'll find that as we follow the Lord, he calls us, we respond, we follow. We have to leave something behind. Our sins, of course, we leave. We repent, we turn away from sin, and we come to him fully, completely, unreservedly. And so that entails our leaving something behind. When you check up your life, as a child of God, you check up your life 
as someone following the master. There will be something that you have left behind. Bad, good, something that could hinder your progress in the faith or hinder your following after the Lord. That's the essence of knowing him and calling him master. John chapter 13. I read from verse 13. John 13, 13. Ye call me master and lord. Ye say well, for so I am. If I then your lord and master have washed your feet, ye ought also to wash one another's feet. We have to leave pride behind. We have to leave self-esteem behind. Or whatever makes us to feel that the work of God, the assignment of God, the duty he appoints us is below our dignity. That kind of feeling, that kind of pride, that kind of haughtiness, we have to leave all that behind and see the model of the master and see the example of the master for it, is, for it says in verse 15, For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done unto you. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither he that is saint greater than he that sent him. If ye know these things, happy are ye if ye do them. Truly, Jesus is Savior, is Lord, is Master. Believers are saved by his death. We are purchased and bought by the price of his blood. We belong to Christ, we belong to God by creation, and we belong to Christ by redemption. The Lord has total claim on every believer. Because of what he has done to purchase us, he has total claim on us. Each one needs to understand what is referred to as divine ownership. He owns us. He owns you. He possesses you because he has purchased you. We do not belong to ourselves. We belong to him entirely. We surrender to his lordship. That's why tonight we're looking at this message. Believers absolute surrender to Christ's lordship. Three things we're looking at in the message. Number one, the atoning sacrifice of our Lord. That's the beginning. He did it first. He surrendered first. He gave himself first. The atoning sacrifice of our Lord. Number two, our absolute surrender to the Lord. We voluntarily, wholeheartedly, willingly surrender ourselves to the Lord because of what he has done. Our absolute surrender to the Lord. Number three, true abiding servanthood for the Lord. True abiding servanthood for the Lord. We are coming to point number one. The atoning sacrifice of our Lord. What has he done that makes us follow him, leave all, forsake all, abandon all, and cheerfully, willingly, consistently, constantly follow him? He redeemed us. He saved us. Look at Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3, verse 23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Without his atonement, that's where we would be, coming short of the glory of God. Without his sacrifice, that's where we still would have remained. We're falling short of the glory of God. Look at verse 24. Being justified freely, by his grace, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. 
He justified us. He saved us. He forgave us. And that freely, without our pain, anything. It says in verse 25, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission, removal, cleansing, forgiveness of the sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. To declare, I say, at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him that believeth in Jesus. All he required and all we have to do was just to surrender to him and to believe him and to accept that sacrifice that he made for every one of us. Having accepted, having received, having believed, our sins were forgiven. That's how we came into the kingdom of God. Chapter 5 of Romans. I'm reading from verse 8. Romans chapter 5, verse 8. For God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We had not turned over a new leaf, we couldn't. We have not changed our lifestyle, we couldn't. The leopard couldn't change his skin. Neither can the animal change its uh, coloration. And we couldn't change our own nature. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood. We shall be saved from wrath through him. Salvation from first to last is through him. Forgiveness from first to last is through him. Our redemption, our justification, our getting to heaven is all by his grace. Look at verse 10. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more, being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Verse 11, and not only so, but we also joy or rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Look at this. By whom we have received the atonement. A sacrifice atonement that saved us, that forgave us, that redeemed us, that brought us in reconciliation with the Lord. It's because of what he has done. That's why we now do what we do for him and do on his behalf. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 5, reading from verse 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. Put out therefore the old leaven, that she may be a new lamb, as she are unleavened. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. It's the lamb of God. It's our substitute. It's a sacrifice. It's the one who has given himself for us so that we can be saved. It says, Christ our Passover, his sacrifice for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not of the old leaven, neither of the leaven of malice and wickedness, but of the leaven bread of sincerity and truth. Because of what he has done, he paid our debt, paid it all, paid the price for a full restoration to God. That's the reason why we're called upon to serve the Lord, 
to seek other souls and what he has done for us to do that and reveal that to other people. Heaven's best was given for us worst. We were the worst of sinners, the vilest of sinners, and yet God gave the very best heaven could give for us for salvation. The most valuable and the most virtuous died for the vilest of all men, of all women, vilest of sinners, a debt we could not pay. He did, he did not have to pay that debt. He did not owe anything, but by the greatest of love, the highest love, the most surpassing love, he lifted us up from the dirtiest and the most horrible pit. He gave his life to cancel our death penalty. Now we're forgiven. That's the reason we're so grateful and we're reaching out and we're telling other people, here is what he's done for us. Here is what he can do for them. He cleansed us. There are other people who are dirty. They're defiled. They do not know they will get their cleansing, their salvation. We know because it's been done for us. Some of them are trying to work it out by themselves. We go to them and we say, no, you don't have to do that. He's done it for us. He's done it for me. I'm forgiven. I'm cleansed. And it was free. He converted us. He changed us. There are many people who are trying to change their own character. They are trying to change themselves, and we're going to tell them, no, you don't have to do that. He did it for us, free of charge. And he's no respecter of persons, and he doesn't have any favorite. If he's done it for us, he'll do it for them. He emancipated us. That means he set us free. He broke our yoke. He canceled our debt. He can do it for them. He'll do it for them. He adopted us into God's family. We're not children of God. We were children, sons and daughters of Satan. But he brought us out of darkness. And he has adopted us into the family of the great king. What is known for them, for us, he will do for them. He recreated us to become one of the conquerors in his name. He empowered us for service, the service of our Lord the service of our master, the service of our king, he strengthened us, he transformed us, and he has enlisted us in the army of the Lord. He's done it for us. We're calling upon other people. He will do it for them too. Look at Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. I'm reading from verse 2. And walk in love, as Christ also has loved us, and has given himself for, a, for us an offering and a sacrifice, a tuning sacrifice to God for his sweet, his sweet smelling savor. That's what he's done for us, and that's what he's going to do for other people. Amen. But they don't know we must tell them. That gets us to point number two, our absolute surrender to the Lord. Our absolute surrender to the Lord. The people that got the salvation before us and knew the Lord before us, what he did was to leave every other sin and go and inform other people, see what he's done for me and see what he can do for you both men and women that received the grace of God, they went out to tell other people, it's not it for me, it will do it for you. Amen. John chapter 4. I'm reading from verse 28. John chapter 4, verse 28. The woman then left her water pot and went away into the city 
and said to the men, Come, see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? Christ had asked for water to drink. But now she left the water pot and the well for Jesus to take as much water as he wanted. And he went to the city and said, Come see a man who told me everything I ever did. You know me. I have been a sinner. And every detail of what I had done, he exposed my life. This is the Christ. Come and find out by yourself. You know the point here? She left her water pot. Selfishness had been taken away. Argument had been taken away. That you're a Jew, I'm a Samaritan, that had been taken away. Tribalism had been taken away. Anything that will hinder a total surrender and an absolute surrender to the Lord had been totally taken away. That's what happens to us. If we are truly born again, if we are true children of God, if we say we have known the Lord, His grace has come to us. His truth has come to us. And the light of the gospel has come to us. And because of that, we leave everything that will hinder us and we go to tell other people, here is my Savior. Come and receive him too. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6. I'm reading from verse 19. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, and ye, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? Would you please underline that? And ye are not your own? We don't belong to ourselves anymore. Our time, our skill, our money, our effort, our ability, our education, anything we have, everything we have, and ye are not your own. It says, for ye are bought with a price. When you buy something from the market, that thing you have bought does not belong to the person who has received money for that. And it says, now we are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit which are God's, which belong to God. It's now for us to totally surrender and to say, Lord, I don't belong to myself. I belong to you. Everything I have, everything I possess, every position I hold, I surrender, I give back unto you. A language is like that of the people in Second Samuel, Chapter 15, reading from verse 15. Second Samuel, chapter 15, verse 15. And the king's servant said unto the king, Behold, thy servants are ready to do whatsoever my lord the king shall appoint. Were your property, were your servants, will belong to you unreservedly. And there is no rival competing with anything we have, anything we possess. We're ready to do whatsoever the king shall command. He is the king of kings and the lord of lords. He possesses us because he has purchased us. And so we tell him all we have, all we possess, all we own, all we lay claim to belongs to you. In 1 Kings chapter 20, 1 Kings chapter 20, I'm reading from verse 4. In 1 Kings chapter 20 verse 4, And the king of Israel answered and said, My Lord, O king, according to thy saying, I am thine and all that I possess. You want to mark that in your Bible? 
and you want to underscore that in your heart, and you want to think about that every time, that I am thine, I belong to you, and all that I have, a king saying it to another king. And obviously, that should be a language to the king of kings, to the lord of lords, to the master, to the messiah, to the one who has redeemed us and purchased us. We're told in Psalm 4, reading from verse 3. Psalm 4, reading from verse 3. But know that the Lord has set apart him that is godly for himself. We are not godly by our own marriage, by our own strength, by our own power. It's by the sacrifice of the Lord that graciously he has made us righteous and he has made us godly. And the word of God says, Everyone that is godly, he sets apart for himself. The Lord will hear me when I call unto him. Standing up, stand, honoring him is awesome. Standing up and see not and commune with your own heart upon your bed and be still. That means you think about this divine ownership. He owns us. He owns you. Think about that. Think about the implication. What are you holding back that actually belongs totally, completely, supremely unto the Lord? Proverbs chapter 23. In Proverbs chapter 23, verse 26, My son, give me thine heart, and let thine eyes observe my ways. Don't observe anything on the earth below. Observe my ways. Observe my calling. Observe my demand. And see that because I have purchased you, because I have bought you, you belong to me entirely. Think about that. Meditate on that. And then do appropriately. Isaiah chapter 43. Reading from verse 7. Isaiah chapter 43, verse 7. And everyone that is called by my name. All those who are born again are called by his name. He says, for I have created him for my glory. I didn't create him to serve the devil or to serve the world or to build up things that will eventually perish and concentrate 100% of his life to things that will not abide. I recreated him for my glory. I have formed him. Yea, I have made him. Verse 21. These people have I formed for who? Say it aloud. For myself. We understand then. He's been looking forward to the time where we'll come to say, I believe in Jesus Christ. I love the Lord Jesus Christ. And I give myself to Christ and receive salvation. And from that moment you receive salvation, these people have I formed for myself. They shall show forth my praise. They shall show forth my praise. I want you to think of that. They shall show forth my praise. And link that with First Peter chapter 2. First Peter chapter 2. They shall show forth my praise. It's also seen in First Peter chapter 2, verse 9. 
But ye a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him. They shall show forth my praise. Ye should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. That's what we are to do. And that's the reason we are to surrender unreservedly, absolutely, to the Lord. For the true believer who knows he would have been lost beyond recovery. Why it not for the Lord Jesus that came to restore him, that came to redeem him? That absolute surrender is not a body. It's something that he says, I will do that willingly and freely and fully. For the true believer who knows he would have died without seeing life for light, eternal life would not have come, except that Jesus can sacrifice everything you know, for him and saved him. And since he knows that, he says, yes, I shouldn't even be alive. I shouldn't have eternal life. If he has given me eternal life, surrendering to him is nobody. I do it willingly. For this believer who knows that he would have been the slave of Satan and the slave of destructive habits, a servant of a merciless devil, but now he's been emancipated. He's been set free. He said, in any case, if I, if I were not saved, I would have been serving the devil, and there will be no pay for that. There will be no reward for that, and there will be no appreciation for that. And if he has delivered me from serving a merciless devil, then I should serve him and surrender to him on the Sabbath name. For the true believer who knows that he could have remained in ignorance, not knowing the way of salvation. But now, light has come. The light of the world has shone in his heart. And he says, now I believe in the Lord, because the truth has been revealed unto me, and light has shone in my way. He says, to surrender to the Lord, that, that's just the normal thing I could do. The normal thing I ought to do. He will not count it a burden that is absolutely surrendering unto the Lord. For the true believer who knows he could have been rigidly religious and rigidly superstitious, sacrificing his life's earnings and his life's um, uh, possibilities to an unknown God. He says, look at me. I would have been superstitious. If you know the place the Lord dug me from, you will not uh, question the fact that I ought to surrender myself unreservedly unto the Lord. For the true believer, who knows that you could have been a blind churchman, a blind churchwoman, merely going towards hell and yet doing all that is doing religiously and superstitiously. Now he's seen the light. Now he's free. He calls him Savior. He calls him Lord. He says, it's the joy of my heart. It's the benefit of my life. And it's the privilege of my life to serve him and get to heaven. Now I'm saved. I have to serve him. Now I'm made alive. I have to serve him. Now I'm recovered. I'm released. I have to serve him. Now I am enlightened and assured and assured of heaven. Such a believer will not count it a burden to freely and fully surrender to his Lord. He is so grateful and he says, this is the least that I can do. We will serve the Lord. Amen. In the church, we will serve the Lord. On the field of evangelism, we'll serve the Lord. Amen. At every opportunity, without grudging, we'll serve the Lord. Amen. Revelation chapter 4. In Revelation chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 11. Revelation chapter 4, 
verse 11. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou was created all things. Were you created by the Lord? Yes. Thou was created all things. Were you created by the Lord? Yes. Have you been redeemed by the Lord? Yes. Have you been recreated, reborn by the Lord? Yes. For thou was created all things. Look at this. For thy pleasure they are and were created. For thy pleasure they are and were created. The Lord created you for himself, for his pleasure, for his service, and for the work he wants done. And so we don't have to be begging and pleading, and we don't have to be promising heaven and earth, if you do this, then we will do this, we will lift you up, we will promote you, we will do that. This is what we are made for. This is what you are created for. And because the Lord has made you for this, when evangelism calls, that's my duty. Go and reach individuals, that's my duty. Go and reach groups of people, that's my duty. Go and reach uh, the people who don't know their left from their right in those other places, that's my duty. It is not something that will be pleading and begging and saying, will you please do it and look at the advantage? And if you don't do it, look at the disadvantage. We will do the will of God. Yeah. For thy pleasure they are and were created. We'll come to point number three now. True abiding servanthood for the Lord. True abiding servanthood for the Lord. As we serve the Lord, we have the mind of servanthood, the mind of a servant. We have the mind of serving the Lord, surrendering everything, yielding everything as a servant of the Lord. No grudging, no pride, no haughtiness, no publicity of ourselves. See what I'm doing? That's your duty. In Philippians chapter 2, Philippians chapter 2, verse 3. Let nothing be done through strife or being glory, but in lowliness of mind. Let each esteem other better than themselves. What is he saying is, you're a servant of the Lord. She is also a servant of the Lord. As she gives you the open door, and the liberty without any hindrance, you serve the Lord because I know that's your calling. In the same way you grant her the open door and you help her to keep that door open to serve the Lord, the man and the woman in the district, the brother and the sister in the, on the evangelistic field, and every one of us, men, women, all of us, we give all the people the freedom, the open door, the green light, serve the Lord. And let nothing be done through strife of in glory, but in lowliness of mind. That's humility. Let each esteem order better than themselves. We don't have the idea, my own area of work is so important and it's so great. Once mine is done, if his son is not done, no problem. No. We esteem others better than ourselves. Look at verse 4. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. That goes along with the sanctification we're learning afresh these few weeks. That goes along with the holiness of heart, purity of heart, we're learning these few weeks that we prefer others above ourselves, beyond ourselves. And we look not only on the things, on the privileges belonging to us, but every man on the things of others. Look at verse 5. It is might be in you, 
which was also in Christ Jesus, had the mind of Christ, who being in the form of God, thought it not trouble to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. He made himself of no reputation, and he served as a servant. That's what the Lord is calling us to. He says, look at my example. He says, look at my model. See the way I have done it. And see the way you ought to do it. May the Lord give us more grace to be more like him in Jesus' name. Matthew chapter 20, reading from verse 25. Matthew chapter 20, verse 25. But Jesus called them unto him and said, Ye know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them, and they that are great exercise authority upon them. But it shall not be so among you. Here is what the Lord is telling us. He says, the Gentiles exercise authority. The, the Gentiles they command others, they oppress others, they tell other people, don't do your duty, just do my duty. I am going to do my duty. On top of that, you will do my duty as well. And they compel them. And they do not allow the people to do what they are called to do or what is beneficial for them to do. The Lord said, it shall not be so among you. But whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. Let him be your servant. Let's have the mind to serve. To serve God, yes. To serve Christ, yes. To serve the church of the living God, yes. To serve a community and to serve the people that do not know the Lord and serve them the bread of life and serve them the water of life and give them the knowledge of salvation. Verse 28, even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. He said, that's what I've done, and that's what that's uh, the example I'm giving unto you. I pray we'll follow that example in Jesus' name. He came, he served, and is calling upon us that we will also serve as well. First Corinthians chapter 9. First Corinthians chapter 9. We're reading from verse. 19. First Corinthians chapter 9, reading from verse 19. In verse 19, for though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. Here Paul the Apostle says, following the model of the Lord Jesus Christ, is free. He was free from all men. But even though he was free, voluntarily and willingly and cheerfully, he made himself servant unto all. That I might gain the more. Verse 20. And unto the Jews, I became as a Jew. That I might gain the Jews. He says, anyone I meet, you see from the north, you see from the south, is see from the west, is see from the east, is see from a foreign country. I try to make myself a servant to everyone. And I do not do anything to annoy them, to irritate them, to push them off, to belittle them, to cut them off. I do everything with their interest in mind. Verse 20. And unto the Jews I became as a Jew that I might gain the Jews. 
to them that are under the law as under the law that I might gain them that are under the law to them that are without the law as without law he says I'm a Jew I'm not a Gentile but the Gentiles who have no law who do not have the law of God the law of Moses I mix with them I interact with them I don't make them feel that they are castaways. I don't make them feel they are uncircumcised. I relate with them. That's what we are to do. As we see different groups of people, different kinds of people, we interact with them. And we do not allow them to see so much difference that we are this and they are that. That's what Paul the Apostle said. That's what he did so that he could gain them that are not under the law. That verse uh, 21, to them that are without the law, without law, as without law, being not without law to God, but under law to, under the law to Christ, that I might gain them that are without law. His purpose is not to make the people feel ashamed because they're Gentiles, make them ridiculed because they're Gentiles, make them to be nobody because they're Gentiles, make them feel the shame of their lifestyle, of their character, of their false worship. No, not at all. It says, as much as possible. I make myself to be like them so I can talk to them one-on-one -on -one, and I can talk to them as an evangelist to an audience so that they will not feel any difference at all. Look at verse 22. To the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I don't go before the weak bragging, I am strong, saved, born again, righteous, holy, sanctified, high, separated, and I'm not like any of you people. I only came to help you because I've been at the ivory tower. I just condescended to help people. Like you said, no bragging at all. To the weak, became my as weak. That I might gain the weak. You see, you see the word gain, gain, gain every time. It says, all this I do so that I might win them for the Lord. I am made all things unto all, all men. I made all things to all men that I might by all means, tell me, save some. Get them saved. If we would concede, uh, condescend and be, uh, lower ourselves and humble ourselves and serve the people and preach to them without uh, showing any superiority uh, attitude, we're going to win many souls to the Lord in Jesus' name. And this I do for the gospel's sake, that I might be partaker thereof with you. That same grace that Christ manifested will manifest in Jesus' name. And the grace Paul the Apostle manifested we will manifest in Jesus' name. The true servants live in obedience. The true servant of God will not uh, live as if I'm not uh, for that. I'm higher than that. I'm better than that. I'm greater than that. I cannot bend low to that, to do that. The true servant of God and the true servant of Christ lives in obedience to the word of the master. If the master says go, no argument. If he says bring them in, no argument. If he says preach the gospel to every creature, there is no argument. If he says go touch their lives and go bring them the light of the gospel, there is no argument. The servant does not change the word of the unchangeable Lord. The servant does not overrule the word of his Lord. The Lord has spoken and that's final. The servant does not pretend to be wiser than his Lord who is wiser than Solomon. The true servant of God cheerfully submits to the authority of his Lord even when he does not understand. You are a servant of God. You are a child of God. 
He makes you a soul winner. I make you fishers of men. Even when we don't understand, we're reaching these people, we're touching these people, and we're preaching the gospel to these people. We're taking this new privilege to these kind of people. Even when we don't understand the details, we're ready to obey. We'll obey in Jesus' name. We're willing to be all things to all people. And we're willing to do all he has commanded. We have decided we're going to follow the Lord in all things. Easy or challenging, we constantly affirm Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. And what he has commanded us to do as our Lord, we're going to do. We're looking at Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19. I read from verse 10. And then I come to verse 13. Luke chapter 19. We're reading from verse 10. It says in verse 10, For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. That was his own life. And now he passes that to us. Verse 13. And he called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds and said unto them, What did he say unto us? What's he saying unto us today? What's he saying to you in particular? Occupy till I come. You will not be tired. You will not be weary. Amen. You will not faint. Amen. God will give you abundant grace and strength and power to occupy until he comes in Jesus' name. Amen. Even when you don't know what to say, open your mouth wide and you will feel it. Amen. Even when you appear tired, still get up and go and strength will come unto you. Amen. We have laid our hands on the plow. We are not going to look back. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. And he has given us the same assignment. And he says, we we'll do it every time. And we we'll do it everywhere. We we'll do it at every opportunity. Occupy till I come. Will you? Yeah. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord and say, Lord, here we are. We'll occupy until you come. We'll evangelize until you come. We'll surrender, keep on surrendering absolutely until you come. We will serve and keep on serving until you come. We'll keep on preaching the gospel. We'll keep on opening the eyes of the blind. And we'll keep on giving the water of life. And we'll keep on helping the people that do not know as much as we know so that they will come into the gospel. Let no day pass in idleness. Occupy until it comes.